Okay, it's just afternoon, so we can get started. Um, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for today's discussion on elder financial abuse. My name is Corinne Shortridge. I'm a customer services librarian at Vancouver Island Regional Library, and I'll be moderating today's panel. Please note that today's session will be recorded. I want to start um, by acknowledging that we're hosting this webinar from the traditional and unceded territory of the Snanemo First Nation, whose relationship with, this, with the land continues to this day. Um, just bear with me one moment, technology. As you may know, June 15th, 2021 is World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. And elder financial abuse is the most commonly identified type of elder abuse. Today, our three expert panelists will explore important issues related to elder financial abuse, including how to identify the warning signs, how to avoid elder financial abuse, and how to report it. Before we get started, let me quickly introduce our panelists. We have Pamela McDonald. She's the Director of Communications and Education with the British Columbia Securities Commission. Pamela oversees the BCSC's Investor Education Program that aims to empower BC investors to protect their financial interests and help them make informed investment decisions. We also have Isabel McKenzie. She's BC's Seniors Advocate Isabel leads the Office of the Seniors Advocate, which monitors and analyzes senior services and issues in BC and makes recommendations to government and service providers to address systemic issues. The office also provides information and referrals for individuals who are navigating senior services and tracks their concerns. Sergeant Perry Minwaring is the District Response Sergeant with North Vancouver's Community Policing Station. Over her 25 year career, Perry has specialized in financial and commercial crime. She is currently focused on crime prevention and is a strong advocate for preventing senior abuse. I'd like to just ask at this time that if you have questions, please just save them for the end of the presentation. We'll have a dedicated Q&A period at that time. So we'll answer and address your questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, so I'll get started with my first question. It's for Isabel. Isabel, what is financial, what is elder financial abuse? Well, there's a distinction between the kind of financial abuse that any of us may fall victim to, uh, you know, people who are trying to get us to part with our money for nefarious purposes. But there are some unique characteristics to what we would call elder financial abuse that are reflective of the unique circumstances of older adults versus the rest of the population. And so what you see uh, in terms of elder financial abuse is uh, sometimes it's outright commercial fraud. It's based often on the desire of seniors to produce an income from their investments, something most of us don't do when we're working. We get our income from our job. Uh, seniors are relying on uh, their investments, and so they, are, uh, they, they like to enjoy robust returns, and that can sometimes lead them down a, a, a road of potential financial fraud. Also that they, as we get older, we want more certainty on things. So repairs to homes and repairs to cars and other kinds of things that we might be convinced we need. 
uh, more so uh, because of the, the certainty that, that people are, are proposing to us. Um, seniors more so than younger people also have low incomes, but large asset bases, their home, their, uh, as I said previously, their investments, all that leaves them a little bit more susceptible uh, to what I would call the sort of commercial fraud and, and commercial financial abuse. The other area that you'll see uh, elder financial abuse in, however, is with family members. And this is perhaps the most difficult and troubling area to deal with because it can look very different. Uh, and often family members may not think they're financially abusing their uh, loved one, but in, indeed they are. And you can see this uh, you know, across a spectrum from uh, outright theft of funds by family members from accounts that their mom or dad has given them access to. Just simply, uh, some of them see it as uh, uh, front loading what, what they perceive as their inheritance and, and they rationalize uh, how uh, mom or dad would, would actually want them for it. So it's a, a fairly uh, broad spectrum that can constitute elder uh, financial abuse. Thanks, Isabel. Great, my next question is for Pam. Pam, why is the BCSC concerned about elder financial abuse? Well, we know that elderly people or seniors um, are particularly vulnerable to financial abuse and exploitation. And we know that because um, financial abuse is the most commonly reported type of abuse that people may experience later in life. It accounts for over 50% of elder abuse situations that are reported. And we also know that people who are 65 or older um, are the most likely age group to report being the victims of financial fraud in Canada. And also seniors and elderly people in general, they face additional barriers to reporting and to getting help. Uh, due to issues like um, isolation, perhaps cognitive decline, and, and sometimes even fear. And so, you know, because of all these things, and with a growing uh, population of seniors in our communities, it's really more important than ever to help protect those people and those communities, um, you know, who may become the victim of financial exploitation um, and investment fraud. So World Elder Abuse Awareness Day is, is particularly, it's important any year, um, but particularly important this year because the pandemic um, has forced many seniors to become even more isolated as they haven't been able to, to get out or socialize, uh, or just get out and do some of the things that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And we know that is one of the key risk factors for um, experiencing financial abuse. Great, thank you. Okay, my next question is for Perry. Perry, what are common types of elder financial abuse? What are common types of elder financial abuse cases that are reported to the RCMP? That's a really good question. And uh, I think the key term there is reported to the RCMP or the local police agency. Uh, what we get, uh, we have, if you look at the stats, um, we see a lot of scams coming in. They're more often reported than other types of frauds that affect seniors. And if you look at some of the stats that the Better Business Bureau puts out and the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre, we're looking at that only about 5% of frauds are, are scams are reported. So when you, when you look at the stats, we're seeing more coming in regarding the, the CRA scam, which is uh, uh, you get, get a phone call or you get an email or a text message saying, this is the CRA and you're, you're owing taxes and you must pay them now or we're gonna send law enforcement to your door. And uh, they make threats and they intimidate the, the victim on the other end of the line. And this is particularly worrying for people who, who may have feel they may owe their taxes. They may, maybe they forgot to pay them. Or we also find with uh, newcomers to Canada, especially seniors who may not have um, English as a first language can be really uh, vulnerable to this type of scam. So we're seeing that still a lot, the CRA scam where you have to pay in Bitcoin and they keep the victims on the line for a long time. And similar ones uh, such as the Amazon scam, if you've, you've got, we had a, a parcel delivered to your door 
and it was damaged and the, the victim's confused and says, I, I don't understand. Oh, we're gonna put you over to our customer service line here. And uh, that person on customer service who isn't really a customer service asks for personal information and uh, proceeds to get some information out of the victim who then is later defrauded of their money. So we see a lot of those around there. We still have romance scams still uh, takes a big seat with us too. We get reports of that. Those are the bigger amounts of money that are given away. Uh, we also see um, phishing ones are big too. And uh, just a very brief background on phishing. It's uh, you might get an email that show, looks like it's from uh, a proper pro a corporation. So maybe a hydro company or something. And really it's a fraudulent, uh, it's a fraudulent one. It looks similar and it has a link for you to click on or a number for you to call to say, you know, I'm getting a bill here that uh, isn't mine or it's the wrong amount. And then they'll say, okay, we'll check your account and get further information from you, your, some of your personal identity, which they use to defraud you later on and use your identity for other purposes. So those are the types of ones we're seeing. We do see um, other ones such as uh, power of attorney abuse, uh, caregiver abuse, uh, financial abuse will pop up occasionally, but usually those are more exploratory with us um, asking us, is this really a fraud? Is this something that police will investigate? And absolutely we will. We can look at those on a civil side and on a criminal side, but it's um, we don't see them as often as maybe Isabel might hear about those more often than the police. Thank you. It's good to know. Okay, my next question is for Pam. Pam, what is affinity fraud and how does it relate to elder financial abuse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Corinne. This is an important one. Affinity fraud happens when someone, um, it could be a family member, uh, could be a close friend, or in the case of a senior, it could be a caregiver. When that person targets somebody that they know well. So this is really important to know and to watch out for because, you know, all of us and, and seniors as well, older people as well, we rely on our family and our friends or perhaps a caregiver for advice. And so affinity fraud happens when that person, like your friend or caregiver or family member, targets you. And to be successful, that individual, um, and if they have fraud in, in, in mind, it's particularly dangerous or investment fraud, to be successful, they need to earn the trust of that person and establish a bond. And once they do that, they use that connection to get their hands on that person's money. So you can see how older people, you know, will have a very close reliant relationship on a family member, on their caregiver or a particular friend. And in some cases, we know those people will exploit that trust that they have uh, with a senior. And because there's that strong connection between affinity fraud and elder financial abuse, um, it's really important to be aware of who somebody in your family might have a trusted relationship with, um, you know, as I say, a, a caregiver or a close friend, because they will rely on those people for advice, including investment advice. Thanks, that's great information. Okay, my next question is for Isabel. Isabel, what are the warning signs that may indicate that someone is experiencing elder financial abuse? Uh, well, the most obvious one is the, the money's drying up. <laughs> Either the uh, account's being drawn down or there's uh, a lot of charges on the uh, credit card. I mean, to the outside observer, uh, sometimes that's not as uh, quickly apparent. So there might be other signs that you're noticing. Uh, somebody's declining to participate in things that have a cost to them. And so you might, you know, uh, have a bit of a warning uh, bell that goes off. You, you know, this they would usually have enough money uh, to engage in these activities. Some take a longer time, you know, if people are usually um, doing regular maintenance in their on their house and you see that not happening, uh, uh, you know, th but those are, those are difficult sometimes, I think, um, for, for the outsider, certainly as a family member, uh, you might become more aware, uh, earlier on around, uh, declining, uh, um, uh, balance amounts or, or credit card rising. The other signs, uh, can be more subtle and are 
generally, although not always reflective of what I would call theft versus fraud, and often from uh, family members or, or a, a close caregiver. And that can be a, a perceived as withdrawing uh, from uh, normal social activities and engagement. And that can be reflective of a couple of things. It can be reflective of the older adult is uh, feeling um, uh, vulnerable. They maybe think they might be getting abused, but it's a family member or a caregiver. So basically they're embarrassed or ashamed, frankly. And so they start to withdraw. That can be part of the reason. The other reason they can start to withdraw is that that close person, the family member, uh, uh, the caregiver is actually encouraging them to withdraw or isolating them from the people around them uh, in order to insulate the possibility of the theft or fraud being discovered. So, you know, between those two sort of core reasons, you can see people start to withdraw and that uh, can be a, a warning sign to people as well. Great, thank you. Um, another follow-up question for you. What are common characteristics of an abuser? Well, you know, it, I was making some notes on that. I'm not sure because what the common characteristics are because, uh, you know, uh, uh, an abuser can go from the, you know, right across the spectrum from the outright uh, fraudster who sets out to defraud and steal from the older adult to the family member who didn't set out to do that. And it's just slowly happened over time. And they've got a long list of rationalizations as to why they are not actually financially abusing their grandma or their mom or their dad, right? So it's, um, and it's a different kind of person that's going to perpetrate a fraud uh, potentially than someone who's going to, uh, uh, engage in actual theft, taking the money from the wallet or transferring it from one account to the other while they're legitimately doing the banking for that person that they do. But I think certainly when we look at the outside uh, person who's going to be uh, trying to convince the older adult to buy something or invest in something that's fraudulent. I, I think they they typically look the same to a large degree. Perry will have more insight into this, I suspect, than I do, uh, but they're good salespeople and they uh, have a way about them that's very comforting and they have a way about them that makes people think that you know, they have their best interests at heart. And, you know, some of the, you, you know, you hear all the, the tricks around, you know, part of it is I, uh, you know, they tell me I need to sell you this, but I'm not going to sell you this because I think this is a really bad idea. But, you know, uh, really what you want is this, even though I'm not supposed to tell you about that, you know, all those kinds of things that I think are the same, frankly, whether uh, you're out to defraud a, an 85-year-old or a 45-year-old to a large extent. The difference is in the 85-year-old, uh, you've got a, a, you know, a, a set of um, a perfect storm of circumstances. They've got more money on hand generally. They've got less income, so they're interested in generating more income from their money on hand. Uh, and you might be the only person that they're talking to. And so preying on that social aspect and that social engagement aspect, <clears throat> pardon me, is something that is different in older adults versus a younger population. Thank you, that's good to know. Uh, my next question is for Pam. Pam, what are the warning signs of investment fraud that older adults in British Columbia need to look out for? Sure. Um, I'd say the most important one, and Isabel has touched on it, is um, someone who is offering you an investment that has an unreasonably high return and no risk. So if somebody you know, says, here's you know, I'm promising you 10% monthly over the course of, of this, of a year, and there's absolutely no risk involved. That is a huge red flag. Um, everybody knows the interest rates and returns because of interest rates today are, are relatively low. 
Um, and so that should be a huge warning sign for you, high returns and no risk. And older people, you know, uh, Isabel again alluded to this, you know, they may feel the pressure to ensure that they can try and make it comfortably through their retirement. And so they can be particularly attracted to these kinds of pitches. So there, there just is no such thing as a high return with little or no risk. And, you know, here at the BC Securities Commission, we see, you um, we see this all the time and fraudsters go after people that have pools of money. And we've seen some of our worst frauds on, on Vancouver Island where there is an older uh, retired uh, community. So, you know, people who um, think that they may not have enough to make it through their retirement and rely on their savings um, can be um, um, susceptible to these kinds of, of pitches. And so, you know, anybody can be a victim of investment fraud or an unsuitable investment, but um, older people, and again, I think um, Isabel mentioned this, they just either can't get back into the workplace or just have, you know, little reasonable expectation of getting back into the workplace to recover from uh, a financial loss. And so the effects can be uh, devastating. Um, another sign is that People who operate investment schemes are, they're skilled at making it sound like their offer is making others rich while you're just sitting on, on the sidelines. They can tell you that there's, you know, there's just no time to ask for advice and that you have to sign quickly on the dotted line if, if you want to get in. So, you know, if somebody is pressuring you to make a decision like this, you should be suspicious. There is no magic window at which time uh, an investment is available to you. Uh, and another sign is that, um, fraudsters may say that their opportunity is known and available to just a handful of people and that you would be, you know, they'll say you're foolish to let this chance pass by. And th that is another warning sign. And it's really important to take the time to research any investment opportunity. And also, if you don't understand it, reach out to a third party like your registered investment advisor to get advice. You know, if you're concerned about any kind of investment offer and you don't understand it or you have concerns about the person that's trying to sell it to you, walk away. It, it could be, you know, the best investment that you never make and report anything suspicious immediately to the BC Securities Commission. Great, thank you. Okay, my next question is for Perry. Perry, is the RCMP seeing any trends related to elder financial abuse? For example, an increase in reports being filed? Uh, good question again. Uh, yes, we have actually. It's been an unusual year with the pandemic. We have seen uh, some unusual scams arising uh, as a result. So we had uh, personal protective gear like masks and uh, hand sanitizer at the beginning. People were selling fraudulent products or promising them and not sending them and COVID testing home kits. Uh, that type of thing. Those were the different uh, twists on the, the normal, but we did also see um, a 35% increase uh, in our jurisdiction of North Vancouver uh, in, in frauds that were reported by people 65 and older. And I looked at the province stats as well, and that was up 20% over the previous year. So in the same time frame. So we had looked at 2021 and 2020 for the same time frame, and it has gone up considerably. Uh, but you know the money, money, um, the amount of money that was lost on frauds hasn't increased that much, according to the, the Canadian Anti Fraud Centre. Their stats there, it looks like there's a medium amount of money that was lost by each person for age 65 plus has gone down. So it's on average about $230 per person, as opposed to what happened the previous year. And that was based on 2019 and 2020. So uh, seniors were losing less money, but uh, we noticed that there was a big influx in reports in terms of especially online frauds um, for shopping. Because uh, during the pandemic, a lot of people increased their online shopping as a result of not being able to go out to the stores. Um, and we saw it, it, that accounted for over one third of all the fraud scams reported. So that was one of the big increases. Um, online shopping, we see a lot of that province wide. We also see that uh, anything to do, like the fraudsters are always adapting to uh, people's anxieties or vulnerabilities. And again, during the pandemic, we see people are more isolated, especially seniors, because they were more susceptible to the 
COVID, um, were more concerned about going out and interacting, and rightly so. So we saw a further isolation or more staying from home or people ordering things for them. So of course the fraudsters are gonna capitalize on those vulnerabilities and anxieties and more people did fall victim to those types of scams. So those are some of the things we saw. Um, and just to give you very quickly at, here to sum this up, I know people wonder how much money is actually lost. So, and I can give you a number for North Vancouver. We, we saw in the year 2020, um, over $95,000 were lost by people. In, in North Vancouver alone. So if, if you relay that or, or relate that to your jurisdiction, you can see it's a considerable amount of money. And especially if you are on a limited income, it's even more so devastating. So those are some of our trends and, and some of the things we're seeing. Great, thank you. Um, Isabel, so um, Perry and Pam have touched on this, but maybe you can uh, give your side. Um, it's been more than a year since we've been dealing with the pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic. Have pandemic factors led to increased vulnerability of elder financial abuse? I think it has. I think Perry's uh, touched on a lot of the reasons why. You know, number one, a whole bunch of people uh, who've never done online before shifted to online and may not have been as proficient in some of the protocols in place to try and protect yourself and your personal information when you do that. Uh, secondly, uh, those who were conversant with doing things online did a lot more online than they normally would. And every transaction invites a potential opportunity for, uh, uh, for fraud or misrepresentation. And I think uh, the isolation and, and the loneliness that that isolation would impose. You know, it's interesting to reflect on the fact that if you are under the age of 65, only 10% of people under the age of 65 live alone. When you are looking at people over 65, it immediately doubles uh, from 10% to 20% for the 65, the 70 year olds. And by the time you get to 80, or maybe it's 85, it's increased by a magnitude of four times as likely to live alone. And so first of all, there's nobody else in the household to uh, give you that sort of sober second thought about uh, transactions you might want to engage in. But the other thing is there's nobody else to talk to. Um, and so, you know, getting back to my previous comments about, you know, the characteristics of somebody who perpetrates these frauds, they ingratiate themselves with people. And so the vulnerability that was increased during COVID is you had people who were going to be increasingly susceptible to uh, a voice at the end of the telephone to talk to because they were more starved for that human conversation than they might otherwise have been because they stayed at home in much greater numbers and they were home alone in much greater numbers. So, and I think that's part of why we're probably seeing uh, the increases that Perry talked about in her comments. Great, thank you. Uh, my next question is for Pam. Pam, can you talk about some of the research insights from Canadian securities regulators on elder financial abuse, as well as policy work focused on older and vulnerable investors? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the, uh, the CSA or the Canadian Securities Administrators is an umbrella group of securities regulators from across Canada. And the BC Securities Commission is a member of that. So the CSA is coming out with new research um, uh, to mark World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Um, now, I, I can't share numbers with you specifically because the research is coming out in the next couple of days, but I can you know, highlight a couple of key things that are important. And, and you know, if you come to our website um, uh, in the next two or three days, you'll be able to see the actual uh, data. But two, a couple of things uh, stand out. Uh, the data shows that far too many Canadians personally know an older adult who has been a victim of financial abuse. So that really ties back to that um, conversation we had just a few minutes ago about affinity fraud and that connection, that personal connection, maybe between a family member, uh, a caregiver or a close friend. Um, it also shows that, uh, the research shows that most Canadians um, face some barrier that's preventing them from discussing financial matters with the older adults in their lives. 
you know, that could just be um, um, a lack of education on the subject. Uh, uh, you know, we know that people often aren't comfortable talking about uh, money issues, financial issues and investing issues uh, with their with their families. And, and that's why today's conversation is really vital. It just underscores how important it is to discuss this topic openly um, with your family and friends, with your parents, with the older people uh, in your lives that, that you're close to. Um, and then you talked about uh, policy. So the Canadian Securities Administrator is um, an umbrella organization and we all make policy on a number of different things. And it's policy in some respects that is for investment firms and for investment um, advisors in those firms to follow. And so the CSA is on track to publish the final regulations um, or rules that will enhance the protection of older and vulnerable clients in their firms. And that should uh, happen early this summer. Um, these amendments or these rules are part of the CSA's goal to enhance uh, investor protection by providing investment firms and registered investment advisors with tools and with some guidance to address situations that they are starting, you know, that they see more of uh, that involve potentially uh, financial, potential financial exploitation or maybe diminished mental capacity uh, when working with older and, and vulnerable clients. So we think these rules are, are really important to put into place and that they will really support both the, um, the older, um, an older adult, as well as provide support for investment firms and investment advisors. Thank you. My next question is for Isabel. Isabel, what should people do if they suspect someone is a victim of elder financial abuse? Well, part of, uh, part of the challenge is that that's a, a multi-pronged answer, but I think um, probably the, the best course of action would be to contact uh, the local police department and the designated agency, which tends to be the health authority, because there's a couple of, of roads that uh, suspected abuse could, could be traveling. Uh, and one is uh, going to be very clearly under the remit of uh, law enforcement. The other is going to be uh, more ambiguous and potentially under the remit of the designated agency. And it's going to go to the core of capacity assessments, abuse, neglect, and self-neglect. And that um, rests with the designated agency. But I think um, it certainly, um, I would not recommend uh, trying to uh, intervene directly or uh, make a lot of assumptions. I think there can be a number of hidden layers of complexity below what a person is seeing on the surface and allowing whether it's the police professionals or uh, the professionals at the health authority to, to do some assessments and sift through that is probably the best approach. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, I've got another question for you. Um, what can someone do to help if some if a potential victim of elder financial abuse avoids or declines support? Uh, that's tricky because uh, you know uh, a person uh, has a right to, to make dumb financial decisions uh, over the entire course of their life, <laughs> and. Uh, I've certainly seen in my professional career uh, lots of situations where family members or very caring friends or neighbors have felt that a particular older adult is being financially abused or has been a victim of fraud, and that individual doesn't see it that way. Um, and they have the requisite capacity to make those decisions. And it's a very, we have to be very careful. We can't start saying that there's an extra layer of um, uh, protection simply based on age. Uh, that's a slippery slope. Really what we're talking about here is we need protections for people who lack the capacity or the capability to make these decisions. That's... Uh, uh, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, that people who have capacity aren't going to make dumb decisions. 
The other thing we have to do is educate people who have capacity and capability to understand the vulnerabilities that they may not recognize will develop as they age. And we've all talked about it over the course of uh, our discussions on this panel that, you know, uh, the desire to get 10% return on no risk uh, really dials up when your only income is produced off your investments versus when you're working. So be careful. Um, your desire to engage with people and have conversations with people, you know, you need to be aware of your vulnerabilities there and educate the public to look for warning signs and to take an approach of if in doubt report and the agency you report it to police designated agency public guardian trustee um, they'll sort it through and get to the to the core of the matter we've almost got to get to a, a situation um, where you know as i say uh, we don't have a negative reaction to an investigation of of suspected abuse, uh, financial uh, abuse, because we need to get to the point where we're gonna err on the side of reporting more than we actually find, right? And that uh, that's gonna be the ultimate uh, insurance policy that we're doing as much as we can. It will, we will never get to a point where we have a, th that, there will never be another case of fraud or uh, financial abuse. What we have to do is mitigate the risk as much as possible. And there's still things we can do on that front. Great, thank you. Okay, my next question is for Perry. Perry, what can people do to protect themselves and their loved ones from being financially abused? Uh, First of all, I want to agree. I absolutely agree with Isabel and her last point there is that uh, people are hesitant to report these crimes. So we don't know about a lot of them. So we do need to educate everybody. So that leads into uh, to uh, my points here that uh, what can we do to prevent this? Well, some of the things we can do is not hesitate to report it. It may not have to be to the police. Um, a lot of people actually in some of the studies I've, I've reviewed uh, report it to their medical personnel or their banks when they're in there. And we are starting to form better networks in that respect to work with our designated agencies um, and our financial institutions to try and uh, have an enveloping approach to this. So we can do better as service providers, but we can also uh, help the public to understand what they can do to protect themselves. So some of the things I've got my my usual list here is, and they're all common sense, but we forget and you know, and myself included, sometimes I'm thinking, oh, that sounds like a great deal. <laughs> if you think it's too good to be true, just like the investment examples we brought up, it probably is, even if it's a small return, or if it's something you think, oh, I get something for free. Most things aren't free. There's always something attached to it. So trust your gut on those. That's one thing I always tell people, trust your gut. Don't live your life in fear, but trust your gut that if something doesn't seem right, it probably isn't. Never share your personal information with someone who's contacted you unsolicited. Um, that's again, common sense, but we sometimes get involved in conversations where we'll give more of our information about ourselves to people without even realizing that we've done that. So uh, online as well to make sure you're not giving out. If somebody's emailing you and saying, oh, we just wanna verify this credit card purchase. Uh, is this, uh, can you give us your credit card number? That seems obvious, but people still fall victim to that. And it's it's very intelligent people. So it's not people that you think maybe, you know, they're not thinking or they're doing making a dumb mistake. It's very intelligent people, all walks of life that this happens to. So um, that and never send any money to anybody you've never met. We see that one, believe it or not, we do. So a lot of the time in romance scams, you see people sending money or if there's an injury or grandparent scams um, or emergency scams is another one. Don't send money if you haven't seen the person or verified that that's actually that person. Uh, check for grammar errors and, or suspicious links in email that you receive or text messages. Usually there's some kind of small grammar error still. They're getting better though when they look more realistic, these fraudulent emails that you're receiving. 
Uh, social media, be careful what you share. A lot of people are on either Facebook or other social media apps and they're sharing information like I, not so much this past year that on their own beautiful vacations to Hawaii. Your pictures can be geotagged unless you've turned that off on your, your phone. And if you don't know what that means, go and try, ask somebody you trust to tell you what that is and, and learn about your computer and some of the, the different things you can use to protect yourself on your computer. So I've got a lot I could go through, but I think so those are some of the, the biggest ones, um, making sure that when you're dealing with contractors, check their licensing, check the Better Business Bureau, make sure you know who you're dealing with. Um, computer ones, make sure that if you don't understand what your computer has in terms of virus protection or um, other features to protect from spyware, check. Uh, you know, For instance, my mother likes the guy up at London Drugs um, better than me when, when it comes to that because it's somebody that she trusts. And it's, if it's somebody you know or trust, a family member or somebody, get them to help you with that if you're not comfortable with technology. A lot of seniors are, but some aren't. So make sure that you're checking into those types of things and change your password. Please don't leave it lying around in your house. Um, put it somewhere safe, at least in another room if you're writing it down uh, or somewhere far away or with somebody who's safe. So you can get it if you need it. There's lots of different things you can do, but those are the main things I'll let you uh, dwell upon for now. Thanks, that's great advice. Okay, and um, you mentioned that people should always report elder financial abuse. How can people report elder financial abuse to the RCMP? Uh, so you can report it to our non-emergency line unless it's an emergency, but um, these things tend to be ongoing over time. But if you do catch somebody um, falling victim to a fraud, an online fraud or sending money, and if you can catch them right away or you, you find out about it right away, or if it's yourself, you suddenly realize you've sent money by wire that you shouldn't have. Um, if you report it right away, sometimes we can get the money back. Um, sometimes we work with the banks very quickly and we can stop the payment or stop the money getting, uh, what happens usually is the money goes into an account uh, overseas or elsewhere or into another country. Sometimes we actually can catch it in time before it gets drained from that account and sent somewhere else where we can't trace it. So report it as soon as you know. Don't feel stupid about it because this happens to so many people uh, from all walks of life. So any local police department, if you're not comfortable, you can talk to a, a a care provider as well. Also talk to your bank if your financial, uh, if you've been lost money to this or they have access to your financial records, um, let your financial institution know. But let the police know. The Canadian Anti-Fraud Center is another good resource that you can also check in with if you're wondering if you've been defrauded or not. Great, thank you. Okay, Pam, um, how can people stay informed about investment scams in BC? Well, the BC Securities Commission has a, a dual mandate, and one half of that mandate is to protect investors. And one of the important ways that we do that is through education, and that's that's been a theme uh, today. We want people to be empowered through education by having all the information that they need to make good, sound investment decisions that meet their goals and that will help them to have secure financial futures. We also know that there is a lot of conflicting information out there from many different sources. So often people, you know, they just don't know where to go to get um, information that will help them make these informed decision, decisions. And that's where uh, the BC Securities Commission is a bit different because we are, we're an independent government agency. We're unbiased in that respect. We aren't trying to sell investors anything. Um, you know, we're only trying to sell education. Our goal is to help people get educated. So I would encourage people to come to our website, which is bcsc.bc.ca. And there is just a wealth of information there and online tools, you know, there's articles and lots of information that is all unbiased that you can trust and that will help you to stay informed. You know, so for example, we have investor alerts about real-time scams that are happening and information on, you know, how to be, how to avoid becoming um, a victim of investment fraud. 
And you know, those, those scams that we put these alerts out about, they're, they're recent and they'll help you to understand what's out there. And it helps you to understand how fraudsters operate and can therefore, you know, help you to understand how to prevent yourself from falling vic victim to an investment scam. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we, we just really encourage anyone who is considering buying or selling an investment to do their research, talk to their registered investment advisor, make sure that the decision is right for you. You know, just don't, don't jump in, don't fall sort of victim to that. You know, Perry said it very well, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So those, those high risk, uh, sorry, I mean, pardon me, high return, you know, no risk investments. Always do your research, always consult with somebody else if you don't feel you have the information um, uh, that you that you need to make a good sound investment decision. Great, thank you. Okay, and my last question also for you, Pam, where should people report investment fraud? They should call us, the BC Securities Commission. And um, there's a couple of numbers I can leave you with. Um, our Vancouver number is 604-899-6854. We also have a 1-800 number that's available through British Columbia, 1-800-373-6393. And, and those numbers go to our inquiries department. And so there are people there that you could speak to. Uh, you can all, always email that group at inquiries at bcsc.bc.ca. And we also have an online reporting tool. So you can go to a complaint form at our website, bcsc.bc.ca, or we also have an investor education website, which is called in, um, investright.org. And I think it's, you know, this has been touched on as well, but people are sometimes reticent to report. Um, so, and they can be reticent for a number of different reasons. Um, but remember, you can always report to us anonymously. I'm sure you can uh, to the RCMP as well. Um, but we know it can be hard to come forward. And but remember that you know, in, in reporting scams can help you prevent another senior or another person that you you're close to or love from becoming uh, the victim of investment fraud. Um, and so that would that's where you should report to report investment fraud. Thank you. Okay, so those are all the questions. Um, we're going to open up the floor for a Q&A. So anyone who's here participating is welcome to type in their question into the Q&A, and we will um, ask it of the panelists. Okay, I have a question here. I'll just ask it to the panelists and any one of the panelists who uh, feel they want to respond can go right ahead and respond. Okay, so um, an attendee is asking, the role of the public guardian and trustee of BC is to investigate financial abuse for adults of any age. Checking information, not a question. Uh, my mistake, okay, this is, a, this is not a question, it's more information, okay, um, good. Um, have we got, uh, anybody have any questions in the audience? Please feel free to ask us any questions and we'll pass those along to the uh, panelists to answer right away. So we can get any, any questions you want answered. I'm just going to kick off the question and answer. I'll ask one more question and, oh, We've got one here. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, just reading the question here. Okay, so there's this is directed to Perry. Um, and it says, I spoke with someone the other day that said the adult was a willing victim of a scam. Could you expand on that, Perry? I was told the police would not get involved because of the willing victim. So we'll let Perry answer that one. Hmm, okay. Um, 
I would probably need a little bit more context, but uh, I could imagine uh, a situation where we've had before where people are unable to believe that they've been victimized, where they're refusing to believe they're still waiting on their return. Uh, I'll give you an example. I don't know if this is what the person's asking, but we had somebody who uh, gave over $300,000 over a period of time, over a period of years, um, even though we had gone into and, and helped him to stop sending money um but he kept it was lottery scams and he kept uh he kept sending money despite what we did he remortgaged his house uh he didn't have a mental illness to that uh, where we could uh, it wasn't at that stage where we saw we could do much about it this is years ago um and uh, we tried to connect him with all the mental health support we could and uh he continued to do so over a period of years i'm guessing is if that's similar to what the person's asking we do have to go and investigate. Um, we do our best to try and assess where we can get that person support and help. And Seniors, BC Seniors First is also a great resource, the PGD. We work with our other agencies to try and figure out um, how we can help a victim of that sort of uh, uh, scam, I guess it would be, I'm not sure. So uh, I think that's maybe the answer to what you're looking for, but I'm not 100% sure without context. Great, thank you. Okay, um, I haven't seen any other questions come in yet. So folks in the audience, please feel free to ask any questions of these panelists. Um, and Perry, she says, thank you. Okay, so we've got one in here. Okay, so the, atten the attendee is asking, we have a neighbor who is living on her own and appears to show signs of dementia. She comes over and asks us for personal financial help, such as assisting with her taxes or why her cable has been shut off. They suspect probably not paying her bills. We are hesitant to help with something so personal. How do we find her safe and secure help? Okay, so uh, that is a classic situation that should be referred to what we call our designated agency, right? That it is really uh, what we need to do is get in there and do an assessment around um, self-neglect uh, and a capacity assessment. So they would contact the health authority where the woman resides and uh, advise the health authority of their concerns about the neighbor and the health authority will reach out and do an assessment. Now the health authority may refer it to police for a wellness check. Actually, there's um, uh, a fair amount of that happens sometimes as well. But the, but the situation they're describing is one that I think uh, healthcare professionals need to get in and try and make an assessment around the uh, capacity of the person and the safety of their living situation, as well as all of the other financial issues. Could I just add to that? Um, I just wanted to ask Isabel, um, just for clarification, because I was wondering if somebody's having difficulty figuring out where in the health authority to call, is uh, your agency or uh, who would be off? They, yeah, thanks, Perry. The most straightforward thing is to say, call my office. If you call 211, you can get through to my office. They'll <laughs> get you through in a couple of connections, but it's an easier number to remember than the 1-800. Uh, and uh, it is an issue, actually. Uh, this office is working. We'll be releasing a report in the fall. We're working on it. We would have probably, without COVID, it would be released uh, by now on this very issue which is um, uh, financial uh, abuse and neglect and self-neglect of seniors in British Columbia. And one of the big impediments that we have is number one, making people aware of what they, the signs they should be uh, looking for. Number two, getting them to report as we've talked about. But the third is clarity around how to report. And I think we need to think about a single funnel uh, through which people can report that then branches off to uh, where it needs to go. Right now, the closest we have to that single funnel is the designated agency, but we did a survey. Nobody knows what a designated agency is, and health authorities are big, as you pointed out, uh, Perry, and so what number do I call? So we certainly have some work, I think, to do around that. Thank you. Okay, so we've got three more questions. Um, what types of schemes or scams specifically target seniors? 
yeah. who would they call? I'm guessing that for me. <laughs> How about yeah, I, um, you know, I think I said it earlier when uh, fraudsters will target seniors because. Uh, many of them have more money accumulated over their many years of, of working, uh, and they are in um, a period of low returns. And as Isabel said, and Harry, I think you said, people are relying on this income to, to live. It, it's critical. And some of them have concerns that maybe it's not going to be enough. People are living longer and longer. And so I think any kind of investment that it it's typical for someone to offer a senior an investment that has uh, an unreasonably high rate of return, and they will say that there is absolutely no risk to you. So I think, you know, while that's not a specific investment, uh, I don't know if that's what the person is asking, what seniors will typically get is a fraudster coming to them with a scam where they say you're going to get you know, 10% a month, maybe even 20% a year, that's just unreasonably high right now. And they'll say, don't worry, there's no risk to you at all. Thank you. Okay. Um, Isabel, I think this one is directed to you regarding um, what people should do if they suspect someone of elder financial abuse. And you mentioned health authorities. Um, someone's asking, who are these health authorities in Nanaimo? Uh, Nanaimo would be the Vancouver Island Health Authority. Or Island Health. They, they, the legal name is Vancouver Island Health Authority, but they go by Island Health, just to confuse it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, and this relates, this relates to um, American mortgages by Canadians. Uh, of Canadians. Um, so the question is, is there any help to BC investors such as snowbirds and investor borrowers in the USA who may be charged exorbitant interest rates by USA lenders who do not disclose charges as required in Canada? That probably is directed at me and I, I, I don't know if I've got, you know, a good answer to, to that question. I would say, though, that and you know the question raises the whole issue of, of fees, and it's just so important to understand the fees that are associated with any kind of investment. Uh, investment, investment firms are now required to be more transparent about the fees that that you pay, and every year, your every year in January or whenever you get that you know, that annual statement from an investment firm, it will disclose those. Uh, the charge, the, the fees and charges that you are, are paying. But in terms of, you know, mortgage rates, um, I, I can't really answer that question specifically other than to say, I think, it, you know, the research there is really important so that you can compare. And if you're looking at making a, an investment that involves a mortgage, um, understand, you know, the rate, what's what's competitive, um, uh, and you know, make your decision based on good good research. Great. Um, the the attendee is following up to say they are not transparent. Is there no equivalent to FICOM? I think what, the, I, yeah, I think that they're talking about, they purchased real estate in the US and in dealing with the financial institution in the US that they obtained the mortgage from, uh, there aren't the same regulatory uh, requirements for disclosure that there are in Canada. And can they receive some of the Canadian protections in the US? And I think the answer is no. Um, they're, um, they will be subject to whatever regulations are at the state or federal level in um, the US. It's, it's unfortunate, but um, you're subject to the regulations in the country in which you're making those transactions. The only protection you will get in Canada, we have some reciprocity agreements around taxation, um, but uh, other than that, uh, no. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. 
Does anyone in the audience have any more questions? We're just at the one o'clock point. Um, anyone would like to ask? We can go a little over time if, if there's anyone with a question. And the attendee says, thank you for the answer. Okay, so just a few, few seconds to see if anybody else has any questions. Okay, good, well, timely, so. Okay, so I think that brings us to the end. And I uh, just want to thank our panelists. We're so lucky to have this great panel of, um, of specialists and experts to, uh, to tell us this great advice and information. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to put up the contact slide uh, so that anyone who didn't catch it the last time can, can take down the numbers if they would like to. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for attending today and um, Thank the BC uh, SC, the office, office of the Seniors Advocate, and um, and the RCMP for this great panel. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the information. Thanks very much for having yeah, us. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting these issues. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks. So I'll leave this, this slide up for a few moments and then I will close off the meeting. Okay, thanks everyone. Good night.